trade care and excavation, just everything airway related. So um, why why intubate anybody? Who, who, what kind of patient needs to be intubated? Uh, Someone who's not ventilating or oxygenating. Someone who cannot protect their airway. Someone who can't protect their airway. Someone who's in distress and maybe tired out. Huh? Burn victims usually have to be intubated, not always. Trauma? Trauma? Yep. How about someone who's not breathing? <laughs> I know we always forget about that one. Apnea <laughs> would be very good reason to intubate. So there's basically three categories, you guys, of patients. We're going to do patients who cannot protect their airway. Patients who basically can't ventilate or oxygenate because they're too tired out or because they're apneic or for some reason along that, that lines. And then the patient with airway compromise, which kind of overlaps with it not being able to protect their airway, but is still a different category. Airway compromise. So a trauma patient, airway compromise because maybe they have facial injuries, neck injuries, and they're bleeding a lot or things like that. That would fall more under more of an airway compromise, even though it's probably that they can't protect their airway as well. But really, patients that can't protect their airway are more neuromuscular, uh, uh, neuro patients, and then like stroke patients, patients who have too many meds on board, things like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So those are the reasons we intubate. Now, because we put a tube in someone, do they have to go on a vent? Do they absolutely have to be mechanically ventilated? No. Okay, you could bag them, but I don't want to bag them for three days. Do we have to put them on a vent? Yes. Well, you don't want to bag them for three days, I would say yes. It's not a trick question. <laughs> Is there a patient who maybe only cannot protect his airway, but maybe can breathe? What kind of patient that might that be? <coughs> Probably, um, maybe not a paralyzed, not asthma. They would be going on because the they couldn't ventilate. Or alcohol. Oh, people with like serious neuromuscular people. disorder. No. Yeah, generally, if a neuromuscular patient is going, going to be intubated, it's because they no longer can protect their airway, so they would need to be intubated. Oh, somebody who um, has soot, where you're getting the inflammation, they can still breathe, but asthma. Right. That's a very good example. A burn patient is a very good example of a patient who might not need to be mechanically ventilated right away, but has an emerging emergency need to protect their airway because they're going to experience inflammation at some point. And I realize we didn't talk about that a lot last term, but we will definitely talk about it more this term. What's so burn patients? Um, one of the number one things with burn patients is make sure that they can protect their airway or there might be an impending need to protect their airway. So burn patients, when they come in and there's soot in their, uh, and black soot in their nasal passages, they're red and flushed and they've been exposed to fire and smoke inhalation, you're already maybe starting to see some inflammation in their, in their facial area. But they're not actually in an emergency situation yet because they can still breathe. But where do you think they're going to be 24 hours from now? Is that going to get worse or is it going to get better? Worse. It's going to get worse. Think about when you hurt yourself. Isn't it not too bad maybe the first time, the first day, but the next day isn't the swelling and the inflammation way worse? Mm -hmm. The same thing happens with your airway. So a burn patient, any signs of upper airway burn or singeing or fire exposure in any way, you're going to intubate that patient more as a prophylactic because they're going to need to be intubated and we need to get them intubated before their airway swells shut, which is what would happen. So that's one patient. Now understand clinically, you guys, normally you're gonna put your patient on a vent if you intubate them. And I realize that there is a patient every once in a while then you, that you don't. The other patient is a, a tumor. So patients that have tumors in their, in their um, neck area might not be able to protect their airway because the tumor is getting too large, but they can breathe. So we'll have them intubated and then they won't get extubated um, because that air, the ET tube is going to stay in until they have surgery or whatever the case might be. And I'll show you how we set those patients up. So like two years ago, I think I saw a patient here 
not up here get intubated and not be on a vent. It's a very rare situation that you'll see clinically, but definitely when you take your boards, if your patient is ventilating properly, so my ABGs, my pH is maybe high, my CO2 is low or normal, not high, that patient is ventilating, we only intubated them to protect their airway and no other reason, you're not gonna put them on a vent yet, on your boards. So you're gonna put them on what's called a T-piece, which I'm gonna show you. And I think we talked about last term, but I wanna make sure we're all on the same page with that. Then if it progresses later on, like your burn patient is probably gonna end up eventually needing mechanical ventilation, just not a right away. So they wanna see that, you see that initially they didn't need mechanical ventilation, they just needed the breathing tube. But then later on it progressed and now we do need to put them on mechanical ventilation. Make sense? Okay. So first thing, um, you have two different airways, nasal, fan, nasal pharyngeal airways, NPAs, which are here, I know this is not one here, <laughs> and OPAs. What kind of patient gets this? Seizure. How much you guys talked about these before? Nasal trumpet. It's a still an, it's a it's a nasal pharyngeal airway. It's all the same thing. Mouth trauma. Mm -hmm. what, well, let's go to this one. What kind of patient gets this one? Oral pharyngeal airway. An unconscious patient. That is the only patient that can get this. Semi-conscious, obtunded, conscious in any way, shape, or form cannot get this. Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah throw up, aspirate, die. Yeah, in that order. <laughs> so it's very common to see this on your boards, and of course you need to know it clinically. If your patient is showing any signs of consciousness at all, this is not appropriate. Hmm? So people, they see the questions and they're like, well, you know, my patient was partially conscious, or they were uptunded. Yeah, well, they're uptunded, they're not unconscious. So unless they're unconscious, you see the word unconscious, they cannot have an oral oh, okay. pharyngeal airway, known as an OPA. So we don't use these very much. Uh, patients who are maybe on paralytics and they're on mechanical ventilation, we've got them totally sedated and paralyzed. This can be used as a bite block. Um, we have much better things in today's world though that can be used for bite blocks, which I'll show you. So, but just now, you could use it as a bite block. It'll keep the patient from biting down on the tube. So remember to size this, or I don't remember, I don't know if you've been told. To size this, you're gonna go from the tip of the mouth to the jaw the corner, like the angle of the jaw. So this one is about right, this one is way too big. So you're gonna size it from here to here, okay? Nasal pharyngeal airways are for everyone else who needs some kind of airway, but they're conscious. We don't use these very much. Uh, patients who need a lot of suctioning will get them. We call them nasal trumpets, that's what they also they are known as. NPAs, someone who, I, I know a patient once who needed suction one time and they put one of these in. The trauma of putting this in was worse than the trauma of the suction catheter. <laughs> Patients who need frequent nasal tracheal suctioning would need a nasal trumpet. Otherwise, if you need to put an airway in and the patient's conscious, I, again, we don't use these very much anymore, but you still are always gonna see questions about them. This is mostly used for suctioning. Do you need the order to use that? Or can you just put This, like, yes, you still need, you need to have an order. If you're gonna put it in and keep it in, yep. Okay, so to size this one, you're gonna go from the tip of the ear to the tip of the nose. So just like that. So nasal's gone from the tip of the nose to the tip of the ear. Oral's gonna go from the tip of the mouth to the, to the end of the jaw here. <laughs> All right? Tip of the ear to the tip of the ear to the tip of the nose. That's how you size an NPA. These have these have these little slots in them too, which is made like you can slide a suction catheter down in it to help suction into the back of the throat. There's ones that are closed on the side. One's Goodell and one's Berman, and I never remember which one is which. But the other one, this is closed on the side and the hole is in the middle that you could put a suction catheter down to suction into the back of the mouth. So. All right, so if you're gonna intubate somebody, what are some of the supplies that we need? 
laryngoscope. Laryngoscope and blade. I have those down here. Batteries. Batteries. Syringe from there. All right, syringe. Yunker. Tag, yunker. A couple of different size ET tubes. A couple of different size ET tubes. You need more than one. Usually the size that we think and one size smaller. Blue. Tip and secure tape for the tube. Yeah, Ashley, what did you say? Blue. Blue. Yes, new. Which uh, we don't have, so I have something here. Here's my lube. <laughs> Something to secure, you're going to be taping, so you can show me that you can tape, but I also brought what's known as the Hollister, which is used at a lot of places as well, which I'll show you. Have you guys seen these? Mm -hmm. Yes, has anyone not? Mm -hmm. Some of you have not, okay. A lot of places use these, they're very nice because you can actually move the tube around on them, but there are places that still tape and you do not always have a trach tube, I mean an ET tube holder at your facility, so you're going to tape as part of your um, intubation and extubation checkoff, so you'll have to do that. And you're always gonna be wearing gloves when we do this. Okay, so tape, what else do we need? In order, your doctor will generally be with you. <laughs> so, but yes, technically. I got my Ballard. Suction. Yeah, suction. Yeah, the you need the uh, CO2. Thank you. And title CO2. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> um, I have my stethoscope. A good attitude. A good attitude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. A patient? Yeah, a patient would be good. Technically, you want to have some kind of oral or NPA with you. Mm. You want to have that as well. Well, <laughs> We're intubating. Okay, but medication-wise. You're going to want to have one of those vents right there. He just said it to LTV. Oh, LTV. look, I got one right back here. Sedative. Paralytic. This one, propofol. I got Valium. Bronchodilator. Bronchodilator. Acetylcholine. 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 I have that too. What? Just to help you out a little. Just our meds, why we're doing it. I have succinylcholine right here. It's also called Enectin. That's the, form, that's the brand name for it. Succinylcholine. Succinine intubated. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna um, intubate. So here, of course, we're gonna have our patient who's gonna, oh, actually, let me show you this before we go forward. Two different kinds of bags. This one you're mostly gonna see in neonates, but do you want to cover it so you are familiar with it? Flow inflating. No oxygen, no bagging. <laughs> so you can't really do much with this if you don't have an O2 source. <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. A little, weak. <laughs> little, little wimpy. Self inflating. Even if we don't have an O2 source, we can bag our patient. So this is what's on our crash carts. This is important because if your patient goes down in the hallway, in CAT scan, in x-ray, in the front lobby, in the lab, all the different goofy places that codes happen, and trust me, they do, and it's the worst place you can have a code. But if a patient collapses in the hallway in the crash carts, you think it might take a minute to get this hooked up to oxygen? Yes, but can I still bag my patient? Absolutely, so that's, it's better to be bagging and ventilating in some fashion as opposed to not doing anything at all. So, uh, and then grab a peak valve, so hold on one second. <laughs> so peak valves, we don't usually worry, worry about having a peak valve <clears throat> while we're intubating somebody, but I do wanna talk about it because we have our AMBU bag out right now. If once your patient's on a vent, if they're on peak, this needs to be on your AMBU bag. So if you have to bag your patient, it goes right here. And it will provide the right. peak for them. I will show you a way Next week, that you can preserve your patient's peep. Like, see, somebody's on 20 a peep, and something happens to the vent, and you need to bag them. What's going to happen when you disconnect them? Their peep is going to go to zero. What's going to happen to their lungs? Collapse. Collapse completely. I showed you guys all that. You saw the difference. And so, what if you've been spending all day long trying to recruit your patient's lungs? And yeah, you have to start all over. So there's a way you can actually clamp off the tube before you, because as long as you don't unhook that circuit, the peep is still there. So there's a way you can clamp off the tube and keep the peep in while you 
first get the mask off and put the bag on it and then unclamp it, which I'll show you. But as long as you have your peep valve on there, you'll preserve your patient's peep. And if you don't, then you're still going to have the same problem. No. Once you start bagging, it's okay. You're not going to lose enough out of here to make a difference. Huh? How much peep? This one can go to 20. Yeah, there's all different ones. This one goes to 20. So I'll pass this around, but it literally just goes right here. So make sure when you're in the ICU, guys, and your patient's on event, you're doing your first event check of the day, which is one of the things we'll talk about later. But you have a question? And then please pay attention over here. One of the things you should make sure is that your PEEP valve is there. Don't ever assume that it's there. You'll see, I've seen uh, preceptors go in the room, they're like, there's the bag, there's the mask, there's the PEEP valve, and the student's like, there's no mask in there. And the preceptor's like, yes, there is. And it's just like, no, there's not. And they go over to the bag and there's no mask in there. It's very common for the mask to not be in the bag. So one of the things you always need to look for is this. Make sure that the peep valve is on there and make sure it's dialed into what you want. This one in particular, and they almost all work like this. Um, they'll just look different. So you just take the dial and you'll see that there's 10, 15, 20, and there's five, and you just take this and you're gonna dial it down so that this is even with the black line for the peak level that you want. So if it was 20, we would go all the way down here to the 20, and if it was 10, we would put it back here. Also make sure if you change your patient's peak settings, and there are, then you go in and you change the setting on the AMBU bag to mask it, to fit, ma match it, <laughs> mask it. <laughs> okay. The other thing that you need, you guys mentioned suction, but no one realizes that you need to have this, you not only need to have a Ballard, you need to have an individual suction kit that has an individual suction catheter in it. Like this one. So when you first put your patient, excuse me, when you first put the tube in and you intubate your patient, you're not gonna have a Ballard. We're gonna put him on a Ballard later for another reason. You're not gonna have a Ballard. When do we put the Ballard on? when we hook it up to the vent. So when you first intubate your patient, you're not gonna normally have the vent right there. So your patient has massive secretions, and that's why they got intubated. What's gonna come out of the tube as soon as you put the tube in? Massive secretions. Massive secretions. <laughs> if your patient is in congestive heart failure, and they get intubated because they're in severe congestive heart failure, who can guess what might come out of the ET tube? Pink frothy secretions. Pink frothy secretions like you have never seen in your entire life. Okay. Have you seen it? No, I got grilled by a... Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> grilled. I always love the descriptions you guys use. Huh? She asked me the first day, and I didn't know it. The last day, I didn't know it. <laughs> I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, you intubate a patient with CHF, I'm telling you, you have never seen so many frothy secretions in your life. <laughs> the, it, the minute the tube goes in, they start pouring out. They'll go into your AMBU bag, all over the place. Once they're on the vent, they end up going into the vent circuit until things get settled down and we get all that excess fluid off. Are you going to be able to successfully bag a patient like that? No, you have to suction them. So. You must have suction ready that you could use if you need to. Many times you won't use this, but the times that you need to, you are gonna be so glad that you have it. So make sure it's there. So that is also gonna be one of your supplies that you need. All right. So you have to gather your equipment, and we just mentioned everything, and then you have to check to make sure your things work. So you're gonna check to make sure that you have a working Mac blade. Remember, Mac is curved, the Macintosh apple. And then you're gonna have a Miller blade. I always say these look like they could intubate an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Which one your doctor uses is gonna be personal preference. Which one you use is gonna be personal preference. I don't care as long as you get this guy intubated. So, but when you're getting ready, you need to have one of each. So you're gonna check and make sure that your light source works. When you put these on, and I'm gonna show you those other ones too, because this is actually a disposable kit, disposable blades, but you're gonna, you have to actually have that click down and you pull up to see your light work. And this is a pretty bright light, they're not always like that. So I checked that. Fresh batteries. And I checked this one, so that's good. And they're hard to get on and off. 
Now if I'm using the other one, you'll be able to hear this click a little bit better. And anyone who uses this kit, I spend a lot of time to make sure these all work. Hopefully they all still do. And make sure we have all the different sizes in here. So please keep track of it and make sure that when you're using it, it gets put back the same way that you found it. So when you put this in, um, you have the little bar here. How many of you guys have done this already? So you're all familiar with it? All right. Click it in, and then you'll see your light come on. Take it out, and then the same thing with our sun. Generally, we go with like a Macintosh 3. There's actually no set. There's probably a set way to measure, but nothing that you need to worry about. Generally, adults, we're going to go with an adult, a Mac size 3 and the Miller size 3 as well. As well, this is a Miller 2. The Miller 2. That's usually not anybody, anything I'll even test you on either. Um, what hospitals out there do the RQ3? That's a good question, and they were starting to do it at St. Joe's, and I don't know if there's any other ones yet, but you'll see that more and more in the future. So, but we definitely assist. So remember, as you do this, you want to pull it down, hear it click, and then lift up and make sure everything works, okay? So, and as you guys practice this and do and uh, get good at it and do your own checkoffs, you're going to have people that help you. No one intubates by themselves. This is not a one-man job. <laughs> and so when you do checkoffs, there's going to be one person checking off and one person helping. So the person helping can do whatever needs to be done, but the person checking off has to direct them to do it. So you would need to tell them, check my blades, make sure they, get, they have a good light source, check my um, ET tube, make sure the cup is good, because these are all pre-things that need to be done. So you're called to a code, or you have a patient who needs to be intubated, maybe not in a code situation, but he's gone downhill, and you're in the room, you're getting everything ready for the doctor or the anesthesia or another RT, whatever the case might be, who's going to intubate. So these are all the things that you would be doing if you're not intubating. If you are intubating, then that's a different story and you'll be directing someone else to make sure they've been checked. So this is just part of the process. Either you do it, and I don't care if you want someone else to bag and you check it and then you take over to intubate, or you want to bag and have them do it, whichever works as long as it's all done and it's all directed by the person who's being checked off, okay? so. Again, you'll have one person checking off and one person who can help. We're only doing intubation today, but when you remember when you actually do your whole check off, you'll be intubating. We'll pretend we put them on a vent. They're miraculously better. We're extubating them because we don't want to have to do all that twice. And so it's all going to be one big process. Okay, so I have to check my <coughs> tube here to make sure my cuff is good. I'm going to use a seven and a half because this guy is sometimes hard to intubate with an eight. You have to use at least a seven and a half to intubate. So you hardly ever use seven. I'm not saying that in the real world. Sometimes you will use a seven, but here I want you to use at least a seven and a half. They all can be intubated. Mm -hmm. So checking here, we're leaving it in the package. It's sterile. Not all of ours are not going to be in the package. I realize that we'll have taken them out, but. For you guys, if you do have them in, going in the clinic, we're not taking this out and putting it on the bed. <laughs> so we're going to check our cuff. I just take my tent and then put it in there and make sure that my cuff stays inflated. If it's already, I'll take it out because it's going to end up coming out anyways. You just, you don't need to touch it. Inflated, you'll be able to tell <laughs> and then and pull this back. One thing you're going to notice the syringe stays on there very nicely. So, once you get your patient intubated, keep this, I just leave it on here. So, you have to do a lot of things with one hand. So, that way, once your patient's intubated, you can just go like that and inflate your cuff. I do, generally do five to six in the beginning. Um, we're not going to worry about checking cuff pressure right after intubation, but when we put them on a vent, we will, which we're going to go over. So if that's not a big deal, if this is six cc's, it might not be enough. In the old time, we always put 10 in. That's too much long term, but it's okay for short term. So in the meantime, we'll take this all back out. So, and then you're going to take your lube. Uh, usually the doctor will have you put a little bit on the end. So you take it and squeeze it onto uh, that you can just 
put it on the inside of the package, pull this out without touching the end, rub it on there, and then put it back in the package. It will still stay lubed up. So generally the tube is waiting for the doctor in the package, with just the end of it out, and then he'll tell you when he wants it. And then, so he'll be pulling on it, the package will still be attached to it, and you pull the package off. That's literally what normally happens. Anyway, you know, every place is different, so I'll just tell you a little couple things I've seen. All right, so now you're ready to actually intubate. Uh, you make sure, then you make sure you have all your supplies, but we've already gone through all of those. So. Need to have your gloves on, touching these guys. So someone's going to be bagging for you, and I'm going to end up being at the head here, you guys. I'll try to move it a little bit so you can see. So you're going to be bagging. Remember, like I taught you guys last term when you were doing your ACLS, I want to see people holding their hands properly. When we bag someone, we need to make sure that we have a good seal on the mask the best that we can. Oh, don't forget your head tilt, by the way. <laughs> head tilt, chin lift to get our neck in the proper position. How are we gonna do it if we suspect a neck injury or a problem? Hmm? Jaw thrust. So you'll do it from here and you're literally just pulling it like this. It's not ideal. Generally, if your patient has a suspected neck injury, what are you gonna do? Yeah, stabilize the neck, but who might be able to intubate a patient with a neck injury? Anesthesia. Generally, a lot of times anesthesia is called and uh, they can bring down their special equipment where they can go in and intubate without moving the neck at all. So there's actually been a lot of studies done on whether that really causes enough trauma to our patients long term with neck injuries to, to do anything and that's kind of uh, inconclusive. You'll see a lot of doctors intubate patients with neck injuries the regular old way. So, But anyway, so we need to make sure we have our head tilt, chin lift, our neck in the proper position. And as we're bagging, remember, you need to lift this chin up because that's what's going to help make sure we get nice chest rise, trying to bag that the best that we can. So the C, the index finger here, thumb here, holds the whole mass secure, and your three fingers down here underneath the chin. I just want to keep you guys in good practice of doing this the way that you should, so I don't want to see people getting lax in the classroom. We need to practice the way we that will do it in the clinic setting, all right? So whoever is bagging, and then, so you can be bagging. As soon as you start scenario, your patient's down. So someone needs to be bagging. So you're, somebody's gonna be bagging. You've gathered all the equipment. You make sure you have everything you need. It works. You're ready to intubate. So from the time you take the mask off until you get the tube in, towards the end of the ET tube and like that. That's gonna cause a problem. That's gonna hurt your patient. That can cause tracheal injury and trauma to your patient. So what you wanna do is, I would say a good rule of thumb is to have it right at the level above the Murphy's eye, okay? And once it's there, turn it like this. That makes sure that it doesn't go down too far ever. And then you can put a little curve to it. We don't need to do this. <laughs> Trust me, I've seen it all. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> Whose anatomy is like that? Hardly anybody. You only usually need, and actually it's more towards the end, a little bit of a curve down here. And I see people doing this. They can't get it in, so they go like this. Yuck, you're about to put that back in your patient. <laughs> I know, but I'm telling you. <laughs> So you have to have your stylet. We have our Murphy's eye. What is the purpose of a cuff? To hold it. Well, it's the technical reason for a cuff is to seal off and protect the airway. So it's gonna seal it off, make sure that air doesn't come right back out, because we need a sealed system, and it protects the airway from aspiration in a perfect world. So that's why we have a cuff. Yes, does it hold the tube in place? Yes that's not the main reason it's there. It's to seal it off. 
How are we going to hold our tube in place? We're going to tape it. Just because that cuff is there, does it mean it's not can't, that it can't come out? Absolutely not. Patients rip them out, full cuff and all. <laughs> and you're just like, I'm like, that could not have felt good. <laughs> so anyways, all right, let me try this now up again. And these can be a little hard to intubate at times. So if you need to, you can have somebody do your cricoid pressure. When you put this in, you, what I see is people do this. That's what that noise was. You just broke their teeth. You cannot have the noise during intubation. You'll have to start over. So no teeth breaking is allowed. When you are intubating, you need to pull up like this. I always say lift up towards, it's up and out, um, not back. So up towards the sky, not back towards the eye. And people always go like this. I see them, they'll be down there and they'll be like, I'm like, oh. <laughs> You're gonna see it's gonna take practice, you guys. It takes practice. So when you go in, you need to look for your vocal cords. This one might not work very well. No, I can't see. Huh? No, I'm actually going to use. Not right now. You'll get plenty of time to try. And some of the mannequins are harder to intubate than others. Oh yeah, this is much better. So what you're doing is actually when you are using a curved blade, you, does anyone know or remember if you were taught, where is the, um, what, what is, thank you, what's it called? It's, it's going into the vallecula. <laughs> V-A-L-L-E-C-U-L-A. -L -L -E it's called the vallecula, and I'll show you on these little airway mannequins here in a minute. V-A-L-L-E-C-U-L-A. So what you're doing is putting the blade into the vallecula and lifting up, which is why I said you need to lift up like this. See my arm movement? I'm going up like that. I'm not going back like this. Because the whole, the, whole, the whole idea behind the curved blade is to put it into the vallecula and it lifts the epiglottis up out of the way. So because I, once I had the right blade in, I could, you can see the spot where your blade needs to go if you're using the MAC and you put it right in there and then it lifts the epiglottis, so that's why you lift up, it lifts the epiglottis out of the way and then you can see the vocal cords. If you use a Miller blade, it actually goes over the epiglottis and lifts it up that way. So it directly lifts up the epiglottis where the MAC goes in the follicula and indirectly lifts it up. And you need to know that and I'll show you when we're going around our station, and once I, you guys start practicing, I'll bring these little airway things around with a laryngoscope and show you. So you'll see exactly what you're looking for. I, I'm not gonna show you from here, you won't see it. Okay, so if you were intubating, you would not have taken your hands off this tube. <laughs> you would have uh, left your hands on it, so. Anyway, so you know the 30 seconds I said, from the time you put the mask, you take the mask off until you get to this spot. So silent out. That, uh, I can't take this off with one hand. That has to be done in 30 seconds. So mask off, tube in, and bag back on. 30 seconds is the time that you have to do that. If you can't do it within 30 seconds, then what you need to do is have somebody start bagging again. So whoever's helping you can keep track of the time. It's like if it's 25 seconds and you're not getting the tube in, let them go ahead and start bagging again. It's not. It's okay if you need to go again. It's not okay to let your patient go hypoxemic. So 30 seconds is the rule. And technically, you know, textbook wise, it tells you to ventilate, uh, oxygenate again for two to three minutes. You don't need, you're not going to do it that long clinically, but you'll see textbook, that's what they tell you. Oxygenate for another two to three minutes. Your patients will have desaturated and it will take a, you know, probably a good minute to get their sets back up. So then you can try again. So once you it got it, have your patient intubated, Intubated. So there's a couple ways to confirm placement. When you are intubating somebody, the only absolute positive surefire way to confirm intubation is direct visualization through laryngoscopy, not your eyeballs. Because <laughs> people like I saw it go through the cords, well, it, sometimes you see, you, you think you see it goes through the cords and it doesn't. 
So by direct visualization laryngoscopies, we can mean like a glidoscope, uh, anesthesia comes down and does it with the bronch. How many people have seen the glidoscope? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's a little camera, portable camera, little TV. If you haven't seen it, I can show you a picture on the screen. We don't have them, they're insane amounts of money. <laughs> so there's a glidoscope, which has its own special laryngoscope and a little TV screen. And you see the vocal cords. If you've, if you've not seen them and you get a chance to, it's very cool. So, and you actually watch the tube go through the vocal cords. There's also one called a McGrath, and the McGrath has a video, little video screen up here. So while the doctor's intubating, he can see up here, it has a little camera down here at the end on the light, and you can watch it go in that way. So that's 100%. What was it called again? McGrath, M-C-G-R-A-T-H. What'd you call the other one? The glidoscope. The glidoscope. You said something before that. Direct yeah. laryngoscopy. Okay. So those are the 100% way to confirm absolute placement. But the ways that are traditionally used otherwise, so how are we going to know the tubes in? What can we watch for? Chest rise. Chest rise. Yep, so right after you get the air in the air, the air in the cuff <laughs> and the bag on. See, the person who's helping can also be getting this stuff ready. So if you have, you know, have this end tidal CO2, this one goes on the here, but a lot of them will connect right in between here. So it goes here and then the bag goes here. So there's different ways. What color do we want this to turn? Yellow. Yellow. Purple. Yellow. Yellow. Oh, it's yellow. Purple poopy. <laughs> yellow for yippee. Yay. We want it to be yellow. That tells us. Yeah. It will if, if it's uh, and if you if it just sits. So we want it to turn yellow. We want to see, uh, we want good breath sounds, bilateral chest rise. Oh, um, condensation in the tubing. Because you get that from your inspiration and expiration, so you'll see that as well. And tidal CO2. Once you've done all of that, then you can secure. Don't secure first, but if it's not in. That's what I said, breath sounds. Rest sounds. Also, generally, listen over the stomach and make sure you don't hear air over there. But generally, we listen to both sides, make sure we hear good, equal breast sounds. Listen over the stomach. And then secure your tube. So make sure you do all that before you secure your tube. Once all of that's in, then you can take. All right? Um, questions on that? And order an x-ray. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll call for x-ray, and then they'll come up. All right, I have to set up to take, and I need to uh, use the restroom, and no, it's not great in an hour, but let's just take a real, real quick